There are common things among these interviews. Diversifying the canon, changing medium of text, education becoming vocational. Studying English isn't what it used to be. A survey of Shakespeare and Milton, the 18th century novel, literary criticism and theory, and the like, have given way to courses on identity, Marxism, or the global south. Film, television, and digital media. Creative writing, nonfiction prose, rhetoric, global anglophone literature, and linguistics. Postmodern neo-Marxism takes the West. During the past five years, the English at the University of British Columbia has expanded into transnationalism, media studies, film, science studies, and genre fiction. Practical work experience for undergraduate and PhD students. Hired colleagues in Canadian, modernist, tr transnational, and indigenous literatures and are now hiring in media studies, cognitive linguistics, critical race studies, and African diasporas. Diversifying the canon. Now, the idea that one should study the semiology of culture is so built into the system as to be invisible to the ordinary student. Intersectionality has become a watchword, if even now increasingly contentious, for identity studies in English. The area of tension is between those who would anchor the origin of the term in the politics surrounding black women and those who seek a wider application to a variety of subject positions. To some, English, and the language to which it is linked, is seen as yoked to an oppressive history of conquest, enslavement, and imperialism. Hence another feature of the moment is decolonizing the curriculum, to the extent that texts like those of Plato or Aristotle are being challenged as white and Eurocentric. In Australia, the discipline of English remains a triumphant tale of Western progress, from the dark Middle Ages through the Renaissance, into the Enlightenment and beyond. Decolonizing this curriculum involves, at the first instance, reading and teaching Aboriginal literature. This seems only the most minimal recognition due to the original custodians of the land our universities occupy, and it carries with it the benefit of introducing students to indigenous stories and ways of knowing that have sustained this country and its ecosystems for more than 100,000 years. Attempts to diversify the canon have only su supplemented the white male center. English, a three-legged stool made up of the study of English literature, language, and creative writing, is in fine intellectual health. The study of literature lives through controversy and dialogue, wave after wave of new critical ideas, each one sweeping in with a new generation. But under the waves are older, more powerful, and more stable currents. The two great streams are, context is all, and read the words on the page. For the past 25 years or so, the historicists have been dominant. It's easier to get a grant for archival research than for more blue sky conceptual rethinking or literary revaluation. There are still professionals concerned with art, form, and feeling, less interested in exposing what a text fails to do, and more about using literature to reconfigure our own perceptions. The critical interest lies where the turbulence of two currents meeting disturbs the sediment. Decolonial movements that have emerged since 2015 include why is my curriculum so white, black lives matter, and roads must fall? How is it that a syllabus excludes by merely reflecting the image that a certain national elite in power around six decades ago projected on the discipline? Those black British students who have not yet deserted the subject, far more obviously useful ones, have raised questions about how their reading speaks to their experience of the world. Students raising questions in the decolonial movement, reasserting the importance 
the kind of post-colonial work that some critics have been doing for decades, even if it was never in the interest of the mainstream properly to recognize it. We reopen our field for a new generation of students who may well be drawn back to it if it speaks to their subjectivity in hopes of changing the world. Changing medium of text. Using algorithms, scholars investigate what kind of signals appear under which conditions, counting the frequency of certain words. Another reaction is to go back to what Roland Barthes called the pleasure of the text. With the advent of new criticism in the 1950s, the role of the reader's enjoyment of the text was eschewed in favor of formalist rigor. Close reading is particularly is the particular modality of some scholars re-embrace of pleasure. There is no new critical direction after postmodern studies, yet the loss of a mythically comprehensive curriculum has been bemoaned at least since the Renaissance, and no doubt earlier still. In other words, historical study too has been resistant to changes in medium of communication. Younger generations are reading fewer books. Departments need to recognize new textual practices. Creative writing has begun to shift the critical question from what does a text mean to how does it work? Education becoming vocational. S student loans and adjunct servitude push students outside academia f for more secure careers. Still, some people live their dreams and are working to reform the discipline. Ironically, the decline of the discipline itself has done more to destabilize the canon than many more purposeful and politically driven reforms have done. Shrinking staff numbers make it impossible to do justice to both the classics and the so-called special interests, creating unavoidable holes in our coverage. Institutionally, however, English in the UK is a little less rosy. While still the biggest arts and humanities subject, there has been a decline in student numbers. Project Oxygen, Google's huge study of the most significant skills for a successful career, empathy, communicating, listening, critical thinking, problem solving, and connecting complex ideas. has given hope for the study of English in the workplace. How do these long poems you prescribe set up to deal with pressing social issues in ways that real disciplines like law or even history do? But enrollments have slumped since 2005 where total majors have reduced by almost half, our university's commitment to scientific research and international recruitment does not favor the humanities, but such declines are common across many English departments. It is often suggested that the economic recession of 2008 led many parents to encourage their kids to enroll in programs that ensure reliable and steady jobs, but is this the only reason for current crisis? Surveying our English majors, nearly all said they chose it because they loved literature, while about half cited potential career pathways. Still, those classroom activities most effective helping to achieve academic goals were essay writing and a class discussion. Only half of our students are aware of the skills they will develop. Once in the program, they become fully aware of what they're learning, that they are learning these skills. Of 400 first-year students from across the Unity University, more than half said they would never consider English as a primary major, citing a perceived heavy workload, high expectations, especially around writing ability, or personal unsuitability. Only a quarter said yes, with love of literature again being the main reason. But a third said they would consider English as a secondary major or minor because they found the material intriguing, because the professor was enthusiastic and engaged, or because they sensed that the program would help them pr develop practical skills. Major choice has little to do with 
the content of what we teach or the methods we use to teach it. Students' choice of major is an effective choice, as well as an intellectual and a practical one. Despite our extensive curricular res- re- revisions, we are convinced that neither they nor skill-oriented learning objectives will bring students back to English. Students who select a major because they love the subject do so because they have the economic wherewithal to assume the employability risks that such a choice might entail. When we are confident about the value of literary, linguistic, and he- humanities research in our increasingly complex, uneasy world, our students feel confident about it too. Even though a minuscule number of Hong Kong students take English literature as a subject for the state exams at the end of secondary school, English still has the second highest intake each year among all humanities subjects in my university, after Chinese language and literature. While elective and compulsory courses in traditional areas such as Romanticism and Modernism are still quite popular, change is being driven by the fact that English departments must shape their offerings to the needs of society and students. For instance, they now get money for attracting students from outside their discipline. We now have very popular modules in superheroes, crime, fiction, and popular song. Courses in Topical cross-discipline areas such as the medical and digital humanities are also popular. Both staff and departments must now demonstrate the impact of their work, leading to a rise in courses that give students an advantage in the workplace. So we in English try to work with charities, galleries, and other cultural organizations where we have connections. Since impact can be demonstrated by testimonials and outreach activities, research that engages with the public is increasingly important. Still, outreach activities for English department lecturers, for instance, are often limited to school visits and readings at the vibrant local creative writing groups. It is almost impossible to win a research award by focusing solely on Anglophone writers. Between 70 and 80 percent, sometimes more, of research grants awarded each year in the humanities focus on topics related to Hong Kong or China. English departments also offer important spaces for work in creative writing, comparative literature, world literature, and world Englishes. And lecturers and teachers are creatively enhancing the role that it can play in the community through creative writing, practical skills workshops, and comparative cross-cultural projects. This is all part of what English is today.